Um, morning, we should maybe get started here. And um, first off, I guess hopefully everybody saw the post on Slack about this revised version of the exercise from last week. Um, I ask people that you know, if they know anyone who's not using Slack to let them know, but that's where course communication happens. And um, I did post an updated version of the exercise there where the plotting for problem number two was basically done for you. So I know there was a lot of problems with getting the plotting to work properly, and uh, I didn't really want you to waste your time trying to resolve issues where you weren't getting error messages and things like that in Jupyter Lab. So um, I posted an updated version, and uh, if you didn't see it, I'm sorry about that. Um, and would again encourage you to join the Slack group so that you don't miss um, other things that might come up, like other revised versions of the exercise. If you had big problems with this last exercise, like with the plotting and things like that, um, I'm okay with extending the deadline a little bit. So if you didn't see the revised version of the exercise and you want to use that so that you can complete the exercise, once you get the plotting part sorted out in problem number two, the rest of it is actually not too terribly difficult. But if you can't get the plotting working, you're sort of stuck, and I didn't really like that very much. So um, that was part of the reason why I posted the updated exercise. I also felt bad that things didn't work out the way they, or that I expected them to, and that you guys ran into a bunch of problems I didn't encounter. So um, yeah, so then about an extended deadline would end of the day on Wednesday be okay? Like give you till midnight or something on Wednesday? Or is that like... I don't know if I want to give a lot more time because then it starts to take away your time from working on this week's exercise, which isn't necessarily good. Uh, I will. Yeah. Yeah, there's still a couple things I need to fix, and I want to make sure that it's fixed before I release it this time, so I don't have to do the revised version. So, um, yeah. Um, any questions about this exercise number four? Yeah. So, uh, why you initialize it? Basically, the the issue is that you need something to tell you the well. So the y variable. Uh, I'm thinking h and x. The thing that gets plotted on the y-axis, h. Yeah. Okay. So the idea is that the the way in which some river profile will evolve will be a function of the initial geometry that the channel has before it starts eroding. So if you put in something that's totally flat, probably what you saw is that the erosion rates never really get any higher than the uplift velocity because basically you start moving the landscape up and the river is able to erode at the same rate as it moves up. If you start with like some kind of plateau thing like in, um, I think it was option number two for the topography options, it starts out basically with like a 1,500 meter plateau and like a cliff on the edge of it. And what happens is the river, because it's got a really steep slope at the edge, rapidly erodes into the, into the landscape. So depending what you put in there at the start, it will change like both the rate of erosion and the pattern of erosion as the river tries to sort of reach an equilibrium state where erosion balances the, the rate of uplift. So uh, I guess coming from outside geology, maybe some of that is not. So I actually think I dropped that. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. Now, I mean, like, more basic question, but uh, what, what do you mean by the array that could be used for the bar attack before the attack Ah, okay. Yeah. So I, I, I think it is related in some way to this fact to the fact that like the the evolution of the values of H will depend on what H starts out as. So you have to initialize it. I mean, well, I know we have to do it for prior experiments too. Yeah, I mean, you don't necessarily always need to do it. If you have something like an equation that solves a steady state solution, you would not need to initialize H. But what we're solving is sort of a time dependent solution. So it's like if you dealt with like the temperature of some object as it's cooling down. So, you know, like some, I don't know, molten steel that cools to, to solidify. To solve that temperature problem, you have to know what the initial temperature of the steel is to know what its temperature is at any time. If all you care about is what the final temperature is, then you don't need to know what the initial temperature was because if you solve the equation without time in it, you get that final temperature. So, like for this river erosion problem, we had to deal with initializing the values of H because we're solving a time dependent problem where like H is continually changing until it eventually it would reach a steady state and we could have dealt with like a version of the equation that would just solve that. The thing is they would all look the same. So the kind of the thing that's geologically interesting is to see how the initial shape of those surfaces will change how the river evolves. For the earlier exercise, like um, the one where we were calculating these diffusion hill slopes, we didn't technically need to initialize the values of H, or I think it was H that was used there as well. Um, strictly speaking, you wouldn't need to initialize those um, as long as the equation you're calculating doesn't need to kind of calculate anything based on um, like individual values of some other array that it's that it's using. So, like if you've got something, I think all my stock is gone from this room. So uh, I've got to resolve that at some point. But anyway, if you had some um, some equation in Python where you can solve like using all of the values of a NumPy array like x, you can directly solve for the values of y. You don't need to initialize y. If you needed to do something like calculate the difference between two values of x in order to calculate something in y, you basically, because you have to go like position by position and calculate things, you would need to initialize y so you have a place to store the individual values as you calculate them. If they're all stored at once, you don't need to, to create the structure first. I don't know if that helps, but. No, it helps. That's like one of the first things I wanted to do. Yeah. I thought I had it. Yeah. It wasn't like a lot of other stuff, but I. So, yeah, and like one of the things here that is tricky is like we have to calculate the slope. And the slope is going to depend on like the difference in elevation between each point in H at every time. And so you need to know, like, well, NumPy has a function that can do that, like the diff function will give us the sort of difference between values as you go down. But if you were to do it like the kind of, without using that function, more than likely you'd have to create something to store those values first and calculate each one and then put them into the, the place in the slope array. Yeah. So. Um, any other questions about this exercise four? Okay, so I'll put it on Slack, but again, uh, we can turn it until midnight on Wednesday. And if you look at the exercise page on the course page, you'll see there's like, I can't remember if the original one is first and then underneath it, there's a, a link for exercise 4.1, but it's a separate um, GitHub Classroom assignment. So you'll click a different link and it'll create a different assignment for you if you do this exercise 4.1, the kind of revised version of of exercise four. So just be aware of that, that um, we're going to be looking for things in exercise 4.1 if you 
if you use that. If you did the original one, that's fine too. So, uh, otherwise, for today, that we're sort of moving on to, I guess, the third of our major equations, and that is um, the equations of viscous flow of rock or ice in this case. Um, and these are just some kind of general equations for basically fluid flow driven by pressure or driven by gravity. And this is what we'll interact with in the exercise today. So I'll do a quick um, introduction to the topic to give you some ideas of how this stuff relates to geosciences, and then we'll look at a preview of the exercise number five. So what are we going to talk about? Well, the main things are, first off, there's a general uh, relationship of viscous flow and like even what is a fluid. Um, if we want to talk about flow of a fluid, it's good to kind of have some definition to start. And then we'll look at different types of flows of fluids within a channel and then talk about some other effects um, of different factors that might affect how a fluid is flowing. I won't spend a great deal of time on that because we won't get into that in the exercise too much, but just so you can see it. But to give you some ideas of things that are nice fluids that we can model with uh, some of the equations we'll see today, one of them is um, a glacier flowing down a slope. And here uh, you can see obviously a nice photo of a glacier that's coming out uh, to, to sea level. And the idea is that it's basically a highly viscous fluid that flows downslope under its own weight. So it's acted upon by gravity and the gravitational stress inside the ice causes it to flow uh, downslope pretty slowly. So, um, you know, this might be meters per year at uh, the kind of faster end of things and can be slower than that. But nonetheless, as you'll see in the exercise, um, glaciers do flow at a measurable velocity and they seem to follow nicely the kind of physics of a fluid flowing down a channel. Another example that's probably familiar at least to uh, those of you that are locals is the idea of glacial isostatic adjustment. So we had an ice sheet here um, that melted sometime around 9,000 or 10,000 years ago. And if we assume prior to glaciation that we had some topography that looks like this, when we put ice on top of the earth, of course, it subsides uh, under the weight of the ice. And uh, you know, you could imagine that two and a half kilometers of ice is a substantial weight, and that depresses the earth's surface by some amount. And once the ice is removed, at the end of the last glacial period, then the Earth's surface since then has been trying to restore itself to its original equilibrium state. We're not there yet, and uh, particularly in the Gulf of Bothnia, you see relatively high rates of uh, land surface uplift that I think even maybe a bit faster than eight millimeters per year. Um, you know, if you compare this to rates of other geological processes, this is similar to the rates of tectonic plate movements. So it's not an insignificant um, uplift velocity, even though you might think that a centimeter a year is not really going to matter. Um, occasionally you'll see articles in the news of like harbors and things like that that are having a hard time because the land surface is slowly moving up and they have to either dredge out some channel to allow ships to come and go or, um, or otherwise just deal with the fact that the surface should come up at least something like another 60 meters uh, to restore its equilibrium. And uh, it is an exponential decay in terms of the uplift rate, so it's going to get slower and slower, but it's still coming back up. Uh, it's probably something like 90% uh, of the way back to its original elevation. Yeah. It's basically just, I mean, if you think about it, that the sea level is not changing dramatically. Of course, it may be going up or down depending on like whether glaciers like ice caps are melting or whatever. But if you think of, of sea level being more or less like as a fixed elevation, if you move the Earth's surface up relative to that, like if you've got a harbor where there's some channel that lets boats come into the harbor, 
If you move the bottom of the harbor up, then the, the water level drops in the channel. So, um, yeah, occasionally you see, like, news articles saying that, like, they've been having problems with... Usually it's something like the water level being low for some other reason, um, and the combination of, like, the slow uplift means that... Uh, I don't know how often they have to do it, but some places I think it's, like, every 50 years or so they need to kind of either clear out the channel or just abandon it. Um, so I think there are places like you can go along the the edges of the Gulf of Bothnia where like you know towns used to be seaside a couple hundred years ago and, and now they're like quite far from the from the coast. So um, so anyway, this kind of phenomena is related to the or sort of governed by the flow of the asthenosphere or the, the sort of more, um, I guess, less viscous part of the mantle um, beneath this region. And the region doesn't sort of come right back up to its original elevation because this mantle viscosity is still relatively high and takes some time to uh, gradually flow back to the region where the um, mantle was displaced when the ice sheets were there. So let's get a couple definitions so we can talk about what this viscous flow looks like. First is it just what we can consider to be a fluid. And the general definition is that it's any kind of material that flows in response to applied stress. Now there's kind of a hidden time scale in here because most people won't think of rocks as being particularly fluid-like, but at very long time scales, um, you know, things like the Earth's mantle will convect in a solid state, but basically behave like a fluid. So, um, you know, and it's, you can do a nice example of this if you push on the table, of course, you can apply a force here, the table doesn't move, the table is not a fluid. If I do the same thing with my cup of tea or whatever, I will experience a different uh, reaction there. So um, a couple things that go along with this is the deformation is more or less continuous. So when you deform a fluid, um, there's not any kind of like sharp breaks in how it's deforming. It more or less deforms in a continuous way. And the stress within the fluid is proportional to the rate at which you deform it. And um, the kind of easiest example of this is to think of like, I don't know, sitting in a swimming pool or something like that and moving your arms around really slowly doesn't take a great deal of force from your body because the stress uh, in the water around your arm is relatively low. And if you try to move it faster, of course, you see you need to apply much more force to the water to, to displace it or you get much more resistant. So um, that's the sort of relationship here between stress and the rate of strain or the rate of the velocity um, in this case. So uh, if we want to say these things are equal to one another, then there's this proportionality constant, this thing eta, that's called the viscosity. Um, it's a physical property of the material. It says the stress is just equal to the viscosity times the rate at which you deform the material. And uh, it has kind of weird units of pascal seconds. I don't know physically how to like give a, a nice intuitive example of what a pascal second is. But um, you can think of it like resistance to flow, or the, the fluid that is more viscous is more resistant to flow. Um, and if you look over here on the left, you can see like this little picture here of a low viscosity fluid on the top and a high viscosity fluid on the bottom. And low viscosity fluid is like water. This one on the bottom is more like, I don't know, like uh, toothpaste or something. But you can see that the water very easily flows. Something that's with a higher viscosity flows as well, but it's just more resistant to deforming. So it kind of keeps its initial shape for longer than this water that basically just flattens out pretty quickly. Um, so bigger viscosity means it's less willing to flow. That's the important thing. And there are some nice examples of things that you might encounter every day. Water has a viscosity in pascal seconds of something like 10 to the minus 3. 
air is also a fluid and you know you move your hands around in the air much more easily than you can in water um, its viscosity is two orders of magnitude lower so um, it's about 10 to the minus 5 honey is about 10 to the 1 so um, that's something you know where again if you take a jar of honey and kind of tip it back and forth you see that like it doesn't immediately flow the way that water does but it kind of keeps its shape because it's resisting flow and when you start talking about geological materials basaltic lava is uh, 10 to the 3 so that's you know still not as willing to flow as even honey um, but certainly much much less viscous than solid rock so if we look at like granite then we're talking 10 to the 20 or maybe even higher for the viscosity value or the equivalent viscosity for granite. Um, and then what we're going to deal with a bit today is ice, which has a viscosity of 10 to the 10. And this is part of the reason why, like, if you filled the channel with granite and sat there trying to measure the velocity, it's not really going to flow very readily since its viscosity is 10 orders of magnitude higher it may actually be deforming if it's sitting inside like a, a glacial valley it might be that the granite does have stress still acting on it and that it may be trying to flow but um, it's so much more viscous that essentially it's not measurable so if, if ice flows at something like meters per year granite would be at something like uh, 10 to the minus 10 meters per year so there's a lot of other things that are going to disturb you trying to measure the flow of granite down a down a valley. And uh, yeah, as you can see, viscosity is quite variable. So to get started in talking about different types of behaviors of viscous fluids, we can start with the simplest one, and that is what we can call a Newtonian material. So that's governed by this equation here, where there's a linear relationship between the stress so this is tau, and the strain rate, which is here as du dz. Um, so it, this viscosity is just a constant value in this case and doesn't change as a function of the stress state or the flow velocity or things like that. Um, air and water are kind of good examples of things that are more or less behaving like a Newtonian fluid, but rock doesn't really deform that way, and we'll see... Um, some reasons why that is in just a second here. Before we get into that, though, we can take a look at just the way in which these Newtonian fluids, sometimes they're called linear viscous because this uh, stress and strain rate are directly um, proportional to one another. And <clears throat> The kind of simplest picture you can uh, come up with for, for having a viscous fluid moving is to put it inside a channel. So you could think about this as just like um, two flat surfaces that bound some fluid in between them. It has some thickness, H, and, um, and you can see the kind of coordinate system here. There's a relatively straightforward way to get to this solution for the velocity in that fluid, and uh, I'm not really going to spend a great deal of time on this because you'll play with this a little bit in the exercise. But um, there are two different kinds of flow that are commonly um, looked at as like end member types of flow of, of a fluid within a channel. One's called the Couette flow, where basically what you do is you have no pressure difference across either end of this fluid, but you just move one of the sides of it. And when you move the one side, it causes the fluid to deform along with it, and you get a velocity that goes from zero at the bottom up to the velocity at which you're moving the top side. Um, and uh, in some cases... Uh, there are things like what happens in regions where you have a subducting plate. The region between the two plates uh, is called the subduction channel, and sometimes in the subduction channel you get velocities that look something like this. Um, there are also ways that you can do this with, uh, with vaulting in 
rock that is um, that is viscous and at depth in the earth, but we won't worry about that for right now. Anyway, this is just one of our flow types, and um, you know, I'm not really going to go through solving this equation. The other flow type is uh, what's called Poisson flow, and this is where you have no difference in the velocity of the two sides of the channel, but you just apply a pressure to one end. And the pressure on the one end here is higher than the pressure is over there, and it causes the fluid to flow away from the region of high pressure. Um, and that's, you know, if you think about this like a, a tube of toothpaste, if you squeeze on the end over here, it makes the toothpaste go the other direction. So uh, when you have fluids that respond to any stress that you apply to them, if you give a pressure gradient to the fluid, it's going to move, and it's always going to move away from high pressure. Uh, now, again, not going to worry about solving this here, but what I wanted to point out is there is a nice example in terms of geological behavior of, um, of things that involve both this Couette and Poisson flow that is uh, in a field that's generally referred to as salt tectonics. It's basically deformation of the earth um, in regions where there are layers of salt. So lots of places where there's interest in getting oil and gas out of the ground, there also is often these layers of salt. And salt has a relatively low viscosity compared to most other geological materials, so it tends to flow. It's also got a relatively low density, so it's something that is not really happy to be at depth uh, in the earth and so you can get things like here in Nova Scotia and Canada where I used to live uh, some years ago there's a nice picture of a the head of a salt diaper that has flowed from a few kilometers down up to the earth's surface and salt is really nice impermeable layer so if you're looking for oil and gas it's a nice place to trap hydrocarbons is next to a layer of salt and uh, so I think there's a an article that's linked to from the course page for the lesson for this week um, that you can check out if you're interested in the kind of how salt tectonics um, can be applied to this channel flow idea. But um, yeah, we don't need to spend too much time on that. I kind of want to go through this a bit quickly anyway. So I mentioned that Water and air are nice kinds of Newtonian fluids, but that rock doesn't really behave like a Newtonian fluid um, in general. And part of that is because the strength of rock or its viscosity is very strongly dependent upon temperature. And what that means is that as you go to higher temperature, the viscosity of rock tends to drop off. And that kind of makes sense that as you go down into the earth, things go from being very solid at the surface to being more and more fluid-like as you go deeper and deeper. Um, and so this temperature dependence is one of the things that's quite important in terms of the non-Newtonian behavior of rock. And here's just kind of a, a schematic idea of what this means. Is like if you look at the viscous strength of minerals like quartz, they're strongest near the surface, and as you go down with depth, it's sort of the strength exponentially decays. Um, here, the strength is basically just the viscosity times some, some strain rate. So don't, uh, don't worry about it. You could think of this more or less basically as the viscosity. It's just scaled by some value to convert it to strength. Um, and so the viscosity itself drops off basically exponentially as you go deeper into the earth. How fast uh, depends a little bit, but you know the strength of well, you go from basically sort of conditions where faults form and rock is basically behaving in a brittle way near the surface to maybe 15 to 20 kilometers depth in most places. Rock then starts to already behave more in a viscous-like fashion. So um, it's not like super close to the Earth's surface that you cross over this um, significant strength barrier, but by the time you're down, yeah, 15 or 20 kilometers depth, rock is a lot weaker than it was at the surface. Um, I'm going to skip that. So the other thing is that the way 
in which rock deformation happens at the crystal scale. So when you have defects in the crystal that are moving in response to stress that you apply to the rock, the way in which those defects move is also not linear. What this means is that um, we have this relationship between stress and strain rate that is not just stress times some viscosity, or stress being equal to viscosity times the strain rate, but stress to some power n being equal to something equivalent to the viscosity times the strain rate. What does that mean in practice? Well, it means that when you apply a force to rock that's twice as large, you get about eight times as much deformation in terms of the strain rate. So you can think about that pretty easily here. Let's say that this exponent n is 3. If you take the stress here and double it, then that's basically 2 to the power 3 or 8 times um, bigger than it was before in terms of the strain rate over here. So for most rocks, the this exponent n would be something like between 2 and 4, and that can be determined from experiments where you basically squeeze rocks inside a press um, and you can calculate what the power law exponent is as well as things like this effective um, viscosity value A here. It's basically like viscosity but it just has units of pascals to the n seconds because you've got over here the stress to the n. So um, it's not exactly the same as viscosity but it's quite similar idea. Okay, so let's talk about things that are related to the exercise for this week. First is uh, just a little bit about how glaciers work. I guess ice sheets are kind of something people know a little bit about here, but maybe alpine glaciers are not things that you know so much about. So we'll kind of quickly go over a couple key things about how uh, alpine glaciers work. So these are kind of mountain glaciers. Um, the first is that basically what's happening within a glacier is a flow of material from a region where you have accumulation of ice, of snow and ice, and ablation. So, um, you know, the high altitudes are the areas where the snow tends to be accumulating, low altitudes are where it tends to be melting. And uh, that's probably not a big surprise because you know that as you go up higher in elevation, things get colder and preserving snow becomes more favorable. In between this area where you have this accumulation and ablation is what's called an equilibrium line where this would be the location where basically the amount of snow that falls is equal to the amount of melting that happens or there's no change in the mass of the glacier um, at this equilibrium line. But more or less because you've got stuff accumulating at high elevation and melting down at the bottom you get ice flowing. Um, downhill and also because it's on a slope and it's heavy it tends to flow downhill. Now at the base of the glacier uh, it may be frozen to the bedrock so these are what are called cold based glaciers where uh, it seems like it's basically just pinned at the base to the bedrock or sliding along and uh, these warm based glaciers you know, sliding velocities can be quite variable but um, in some cases, if there's like a surge, they can be even tens of meters per year um, or even a bit bigger than that. So they can have a pretty significant effect in terms of how fast the ice is moving, whether you've got frozen to the bedrock conditions or you're sliding along. How do they move? Well, basically there's one part is this basal sliding, which is literally the bottom of the glacier sliding down the channel or sliding along some thin layer of sediment between the base of the glacier and, and the bedrock. Um, you know, this is obviously a place where there's a lot of water present, so this kind of fluid pressure can get elevated under the glacier and make it favorable to slide. But there's also internal deformation, and because the ice is more or less behaving like a, a viscous fluid, it deforms internally when it's on, um, on a slope, and it's basically like a nonlinear viscous type of material, which is even also sensitive to temperature. Uh, we won't worry about that too much, but um, it is something that can be considered if you look into modeling ice sheets in detail. Generally speaking, what we see is that the deformation of the ice is concentrated near the base or at the bed of 
the glacier. So this is kind of a cross-section cartoon version of a glacier flowing down a slope. Slope has some angle here, alpha. <clears throat> and the idea is that the, some ice thickness here, H, um, or Z equal to H, is placed on that slope. It's being acted upon by gravity, and as a result, it's flowing downhill. Um, you know, if you want to think about this in terms of the way the gravitational force is acting here on the fluid, there's some component of it that's acting perpendicular to the surface, but there's a component that's acting parallel to the surface or moving downhill, and that's the reason that the ice is flowing. Um, and I don't think this is something that's completely unintuitive. Like you could easily imagine any kind of fluid-like thing you put on a slope is going to move down the slope. Um, what we're going to look at in the exercise is two different views of the flow of glaciers uh, down slopes in, in alpine settings. The first is actually looking at the flow of uh, a glacier in map view. So kind of looking down like, I guess the kind of modern thing would be to say we're looking from a drone, but like, you know, helicopter view, whatever it is, uh, looking down on top of the ice that's within some channel, and we're looking at the pattern of how the velocity changes from one side of the channel to the other side and what it looks like as it's flowing down uh, from above. The second part of the exercise is going to be this kind of cross-section view where we're looking at the profile of the velocity. So we kind of went to the middle of the channel and took a slice down the middle of the channel parallel to the direction of flow and we're looking at the profile of the velocity from the base up to the surface. In both cases, we're going to compare what we predict in the model to some observed uh, flow velocities from glaciers in, uh, I think in both cases, they're from Canada. Um, and we'll get a sense of how this, uh, how this ice system all works. So, yeah, any questions or anything at this point? Is this kind of alpine glacier stuff totally new, or have you seen anything about alpine glaciers before? Some people, but not everybody. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, obviously we're not going to go into, like, exhaustive detail with the glaciers, but at least if you get the picture of like ice flowing downhill, that's good enough to get uh, get started on the exercise for today. So that brings us to this point, and uh, I guess I can zoom in a little bit here. So a couple things. One is I'm still proofreading the exercise before I post it. Um, it took me a bit longer than expected to get things transferred over from the previous version of the exercise to the one in the Jupyter notebooks. Uh, and I don't want to have what happened last week happen again, so uh, I'm going to take a few minutes after we finish with this part to finish getting the exercise together and all that before I post it. So if you go to the course page, you can actually go and see um, the materials from last year. Like if you click down at the bottom, uh, there's this other versions thing, and you can go to, to 2017. Last year, the course was just one continuous course, like the GeoPython and Introduction to Quantitative Geology were the same. So uh, exercise number five this time in the course was exercise 12 last year. So, um, and you can see the kind of materials are there. What I want to point out here are two things. One, you can have a look at the exercise from last year if you want, just to kind of get an idea of what we're going to do, because it is more or less quite similar. Um, I'm going to have you guys make a few functions instead of some things that were done differently last year. But, uh, but it's quite similar, so you can get a, a good idea of what, um, what you'll be working on. But the other thing is that there's this... Point number four here, the theory for exercise 12, that's exactly the same theory that's up for 
the exercise for this time. Um, I don't think I've posted the updated course page yet, but I can do that in, um, in a moment. But this is essentially the background for the equations that we're going to deal with in the exercise. And uh, it would be quite beneficial to try to read through this. There are a number of equations, and I appreciate that like, not everybody's going to be that excited about looking through all the math. But it's worthwhile to try to figure, like, basically just what each section of these equations are, are doing, even if you don't follow all of the steps. I actually wrote out most of the math in terms of, like, everything that happens here, but there are some integrations and things like that that I know you might not be so familiar with mathematically. But you're going to deal with um, a few of the equations toward the end of both, like, this problem one and problem two. Um, so problem one is the flow of ice inside a channel. So these are the two walls of the channel, and it's flowing, in this case, off to the left. Um, and if you look through here, you can sort of see how we start out with our equation that we just saw for this viscous flow. So here's stress being equal to the viscosity times the strain rate, and how we go from there to actually calculating the velocity inside the channel. So I would say that's... Um, based on last year's experience, it would be helpful to, to read through it because I think last year most people just skipped it and then were really confused in the exercise. Uh, I won't say that, that this won't have some amount of confusion in it as well because that's quite possible, but <clears throat> um, it would be beneficial to read through it while I'm getting the exercise stuff organized and posted. So there's part one is, is this channel flow, part two is ice flowing down an incline, and uh, if you go to last year's version of the exercise, you can also click the link to see what it looked like, and as I mentioned, it's quite similar to what you're going to work on. And maybe what I'll do is I will take a minute here just to kind of go over what the exercise covers because, again, the content is almost um, identical in terms of what you have to do in the problems. So, first off, um, as you saw in the theory section, the first thing we're going to do is look at ice flowing inside a channel in this kind of map view, uh, looking down from the top. And instead of last year, the students had a starter script this year you're going to have a Jupyter notebook but basically you have to calculate the velocity of the fluid inside the channel and um, one of the things that you'll have to do is a little bit of algebra related to some of the equations that are in this theory section so um, notably this equation number well in, in the first problem you won't have to deal with it but equation number 10 and 12 are going to come up um, in here. I guess I want to maybe say just something here about um, this first problem because we're calculating non-dimensional velocity and I don't know if that has any kind of like makes any sense to you at all what a non-dimensional velocity is. Um, but yeah, I can take a second here just to say something that uh, basically we're going to calculate the velocity of the fluid within a channel and we're going to take that velocity which you could call the letter U for instance here and divide by the average velocity of the fluid in the channel. If you take something that's a velocity in meters per second and divide by an average velocity in meters per second, you get something that has no dimensions. It's just a dimensionless number. What it does is it gives you some idea, though, of how the pattern of velocity compares to the average velocity in the channel. So you can see, like for instance, what parts of the channel are flowing faster than the average and what parts of the ice are flowing slower than the average. It also takes out 
the dependence on how big this channel is because you could also take away the dimensions of the channel width. Um, for instance, if you divide by how wide the channel is, um, every point along the channel divided by how wide the channel is is just going to give you some number between, for instance, um, 0 and 1 or something like that. So if this is a little bit confusing, don't hesitate to ask uh, once you start working on the exercise <coughs> because conceptually I think it's actually quite nice, but it's mostly from a kind of mathematical perspective. It's a bit confusing, I think, in terms of thinking about things in terms of non-dimensional velocity. It doesn't really often feel very intuitive. So um, we're going to plot the non-dimensional velocity as a function of non-dimensional distance. And you'll see, again, this is going to be something like you'll have a distance uh, array, so something like y that's going to be going from some value to another value in so many steps. But it's the values of y are divided by h, which is the width of the channel. So again, you get like something in meters divided by meters, and you come out with a, a number that doesn't have a, a dimension associated with it. So if that's, yeah, giving you trouble, um, let us know when you get started working here. Essentially what you're going to do is calculate some different velocities and then make a plot that shows the velocities you calculate for um, a Newtonian fluid. So a case where this power law exponent is 1, and then for non-Newtonian fluids with power law exponents of 2, 3, 4, and, and 5. So you'll plot all five of the lines on one plot, and then you can kind of see how they compare to one another in terms of how the velocity changes across the width of this, this channel. This is a steady state situation, yeah. And depending on how you do it, you can solve this without needing to initialize the variables first. It's a little bit tricky. But you can initialize it too, yeah. Yeah. That's easier to do actually if you if you create the array first, it's easier. Um, but it, you can do it without uh, if you want a challenge. So uh, the tricky thing here and the kind of nasty bit of this equation that you're gonna deal with, um, it's this equation number let me open it up here. It's this equation number twelve, I believe. Uh, down here. So you've got this u divided by u bar. That's this non-dimensional velocity. And there's some n's and values of like y and h. Those things are all explained in the exercise. This is all fine and good as long as the values of y are positive. But when the values of y are negative, there's a bit different behavior in how this equation works. And it's something that you'll have to correct uh, to make your plots. I'll leave it at that for right now so that when you do get started on it, you can sort of plot it and then see. But it'll be obvious that there's a problem in terms of the velocities across the channel because it won't be like they're equal to zero on both sides of the channel like you might expect. So. So the idea here is that the y value is at the center of the channel as a reference point in this equation. So um, in this case, the positive values would go out to h like h over 2, and the negative values would go to minus h over 2. So the, the width of the channel is h, but the reference point that makes it easiest to solve this equation is to take the center of the channel as the yeah, zero point for the y variable. So you'll see that for all of the different power law exponents, as long as the y value is positive with this equation number 12, everything will look fine. But when you have uh, negative values of y, you'll get kind of unexpected results. And there's, uh, that's something that we can talk about when we get there. So you'll make a plot, and that's kind of that. And then the next part, we're going to take a look at this uh, Saskatchewan Glacier, so this is in the um, Canadian Rocky Mountains. Very nice place. And there's some data here for velocities, again looking in like map view down 
uh, going across the glacier. So from one side to the other, there's velocity values here. And the idea in this exercise, or this part of the exercise, is to calculate then not the non-dimensional velocity like you did in part one, but to calculate the, the dimensional velocity, um, or the kind of what you would probably just call the regular velocity. And that's this equation number 10. Uh, I can't probably highlight that very easily without selecting text I don't want. But the bottom line of this equation number 10 um, just gives us a velocity. The challenge here is that there's an additional term in here. This P1 minus P0 over L is a pressure gradient. We don't know P1, we don't know P0, and we don't know L. Um, but there's a kind of trick you can use to rearrange this equation to solve for what this P1 minus P0 over L, and I would even include this little to the power n. Um, it's a bit more clear in the exercise itself, but essentially what you'll have to do in this part is to solve, to rearrange this equation. So it's P1 minus P0 over L to the power n equals some stuff on the right side. And, uh, and you'll create a function for doing that, and we'll help you out as needed. But that'll allow you then to plot this map view velocity pattern and then compare it to observations and um, see how these modeled profiles compare to what we see in nature. The last problem, I think it's problem three actually in the current version of the exercise. Um, it was problem two last time, but I just renumbered a little bit, is about another glacier called the Athabasca, Athabasca Glacier, uh, also in the same kind of area in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. And in this case, we're going to look again at the profile view, so like slice down the middle of the glacier. So here we've got um, different depths, so from zero up to the top of the glacier, and then the corresponding velocity of the ice that was measured um, at those different depths. And you've got a data file with that stuff, and you'll use a different equation. In this case, I think it's this equation number 19 to solve for the velocity of the ice flowing down this slope. The tricky thing here is that we again have a term we don't know. In this case, it's this gamma x term, um, which is the gravitational force of that's acting on the fluid uh, flowing down the slope. We don't know what that is, and so you'll, again, rearrange the equation to solve for that because um, we can do that when we have some data we can take advantage of that. So uh, I will maybe stop here unless there are any questions.